Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 29th of January 2020. I'm Robert Bowick, and I'm joined today by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, report proves wider play against Australia Post and the People's Bank, and keep financial predators on the leash. So first, report proves wider play against Australia Post, People's Bank. Um, Craig, we've had a victory for the three R's campaign. Yep. So since earlier this year or sort of late last year, we knew there was a report into the Christine Holgate Cardia Watches Affair. Um, it had taken about the month of November to, to complete and the government sat on it. And they indicated they were going to sit on it um, and actually make a cabinet confidence so it could be kept secret for two decades. Mm -hmm. So we went on a campaign which we called the three R's. Release the report, replace the board, reinstate Christine Holgate. And that's exactly what's happened, right? Well, the first one, re well, release the report. Robbie, they couldn't sit on it. I mean, the government, this is such an explosive issue with Christian Holgate. It could bring the government down. And I think uh, that comment's being made by others. Others have made that comment, and, and yes. Look, we were even a bit stunned when we saw the fact that the, uh, the metadata on the report had been changed. Now, we don't know what that means, but that's another uh, concerning reality of why was it changed? I mean, yes. Well, what you're referring to, the, metadata can be changed by something as simple as just copying it, but it can also mean a change in, in terms of the report itself. So it was, it was modified the day before it was made public, which was, it was made public last Friday at four o'clock, because this is Friday today, last Friday at four o'clock, which was the Friday before the, long, the, the um, Australia Day long weekend. And it's the definition of taking out the trash. But Robbie, so they made it, it raises a question to me. Is it the same report that Maddox gave the government or is it different? Well, that's what... That's the problem. You, people are, there are um, people who are involved in this asking that question. However, that said, um, there was a report released and it is very revealing. And what we're going to do, Craig, is play our very latest um, YouTube video ad on this subject. It goes for four and a half minutes. And we're going to be playing this around YouTube so to get the word out so that people see what the truth about this report is from that ad. So let's just play it. Watch that now. Everything you initially heard about Christine Holgate and the Cartier Watches affair was dead wrong. And there's a government report that proves it. It's now blowing up in Scott Morrison's face. This represents an historic opportunity to turn the tables on the big four banks. And Australia Post Bank is now possible. I'm Robert Barwick of the Citizens Party. As our party has previously reported, Christine Holgate was targeted for defamation because she represents a threat to the big four banks' corrupt monopoly. She got them to reimburse Australia Post $100 million annually for banking services provided on the cheap to big four customers in rural areas who had been abandoned by the banks. Without Australia Post, these rural customers would have had no access to banking services because the banks shut down hundreds of their smaller branches to maximise profits. Even more alarming for the big four than the $100 million concession was that in 2018, Christine Holgate was reported to be in talks to make Australia Post into a bank. The big banks saw this as a threat to their monopoly. And as this report puts it, they will fight it tooth and nail. Indeed, a postal bank would have many benefits for Australians including providing safety from bail-in, offering convenient service to rural communities abandoned by the big banks, and contribute to Australian economic development by investing in infrastructure projects. Holgate rewarded the four top executives for negotiating this $100 million deal by giving them $5,000 Cartier watches. In a cheap piece of political theatre, Scott Morrison demanded she resign saying the use of taxpayers' money to buy the watches was disgraceful and ordered Christine Holgate to stand down pending an investigation. Well, now the investigative report has been completed and it concludes Christine Holgate broke no laws or rules. The report was conducted by the Maddox law firm, hired by the Morrison government. The report says quite clearly, there is no indication of dishonesty, fraud, corruption or intentional misuse of Australia Post funds relating to the Cartier watches. However, in a disgusting gambit to continue the character defamation, the report argues that since there are no specific rules governing the rewarding of executives for performance with watches, therefore, according to the report, Christine Holgate did not do the right thing. So Christine Holgate did something wrong because she failed to follow a rule that did not exist? 
Adding to the picture, John Stanhope was the Australia Post chairman of the board when the watches were purchased in 2018. He admitted he agreed to reward the executives and they deserved it, and the amount of the reward was not an issue. He also said, I do think Christine has been caught in some kind of wider play. Isn't it clear this is a deliberate witch hunt targeting Christine Holgate for defamation? Think about it. The Morrison government spent at least $100,000 to create this report, which investigated $20,000 in watches. The Maddox report proves Barnaby Joyce was right when he did an abrupt about turn in the parliament on the 2nd of December, admitting he was wrong to condemn Holgate. The Citizens Party said from the beginning this was a politically motivated character assassination on behalf of the big four banks. We call for the board of Australia Post to be replaced. They have demonstrated themselves to be spineless participants in a witch hunt. In addition, we agree with Bob Catter MP and call for Christine Holgate to be reinstated to her position as CEO of Australia Post. This is necessary to restore the viability of Australia Post and of the small business families who run its licensed post offices. The LPOs support Christine Holgate. They say Christine Holgate is the best CEO they've ever had. And in fact, she saved them from bankruptcy and ruin. So replace the Australia Post board and reinstate Christine Holgate. Most importantly, please sign our petition calling for an Australia Post bank. The exoneration and reinstatement of Christine Holgate is urgent on its own terms. It's also an historic opportunity to give Australians a better future by creating a national postal bank. We need your support to make it happen. So there you go. That tells the story. Right now, Craig, I want to focus on the comment of the former chairman that we quoted in that ad, John Stanhope. Now, he said on the 24th of October, 2020, and this was two days after that display of outrage in Parliament by Scott Morrison, where he said it was disgraceful. Right? Two days later in the Financial Review, um, John Stanhope said, I do think Christine has been caught up in some kind of wider play. Now, what he's admitting is there's a bigger agenda here, right? And that's what, to us, jumps out from the report. Because although the report can find no actual wrongdoing of that Chris, from Christine, it comes up with a finding against her based on a ridiculous premise that was she specifically authorised to buy watches by anything in Australia Post rules? Well, as we quoted in our press release on the subject, former ANZ director John Darlson, a very ex experienced director on a number of boards in Australia, he, he said it, it is outrageous to tie a, a CEO down to something so ridiculously specific, right? No, the rule, rules don't work that way, right? Um, but that's what they had to contrive in order to find, come up with a finding against her. Because, um, Robbie, the issue here, as we said, the wider play, what is it? The sell-off of Australia Post, the privatisation of Australia Post. Now, unfortunately for, for the government, which has been the doyen, the Liberal Party government has been the doyen of selling off public assets for the benefit of the private sector and for the banks and so forth, Christine Holgate represented a complete roadblock to that because she made Australia Post profitable. That's right. Where it was supposed to be this big... It's easy uh, to sell if, if it's making a loss and they say, oh, see, the public sector can't do anything good, we'll give it to the private sector. A big stone around she the government's profitable. Net. Yeah, yeah. It's, this thing's a dead duck, it should be sold off, get rid of it, it's a public burden. In fact, it's the complete opposite. And yes. that's what they, the, the government's now caught with, uh, of, of trying to deal with. with and done. now, we'd, in the ad people just saw, we, we focus on the, the question of taking on the threat to the banking monopoly, right? The, the big four's banking monopoly. And as we said from the beginning, that's definitely part of the agenda as well. But just further to what you said, Craig, about the, um, about the privatisation agenda and, and, um, and, the, and the Liberal Party, John Stanhope himself, the chairman is who admitted there was a bigger agenda, he, um, he was a former long-term person at Telstra before he joined Australia Post as chairman. And he's credited with the guy who, who drove the privatisation of Telstra in the 1990s, right? So he comes onto the Australia Post board and the Sydney Morning Herald article at the time said, um, it looks like there's a long play here to privatise Australia Post and this is the guy to do it, basically, right? Um, and then the other thing to notice about Australia Post is its board is totally stacked by the Liberal Party. Now, um, 
So when Christine was, when they had this finding in the report against Christine, it's based on one, contriving a ridiculous premise, but two, they said it's based on the word of the board members. And even though the report ad admits they weren't required to talk under oath. So they weren't required to tell the truth, right? And they all said something that was comp completely convenient for Scott uh, Morrison. They all backed him up. And they all said, one, they didn't know about the watches until two years later. And two, if they had have known about them, they would never, ever, ever have, have approved the buying of watches because watches are so terrible. Um, but it's later come out that they, all, they actually, when that same chairman, John Stanhope, retired, Christine Holgate purchased him a parting gift, which was a $2,000 Mont Blanc pen. And the same board members who claimed they would never have approved watches all approved the purchase of that pen. So it completely beggars belief that they're telling the truth. They're, they're not, right? Well, they weren't under oath, Robbie, as you point out. And well, that's of course. the key here. That, if you're not under oath, what do you expect? So here's, let me just identify who they are, Craig. Six of the current board members were there when it happened. Four of them are Liberals. Former, former Queensland LNP President Bruce McIver. Former John Howard Advisor and Victorian Liberal State Director Tony Nutt. Former MP, Senator and Minister Michael Ronaldson and former Chief of Staff to two Liberal WA Premiers, Deirdre Wilmot. So these aren't just run-of-the-mill Liberals, these are top, top, top Liberals, right? And that's who the board is stacked with. And the combination of all that produced an outcome convenient to Scott Morrison's justification, but totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll just talk about the overall, the larger implications of this. Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're discussing report proves wider play against Australia Post, People's Bank. Um, now, Craig, we've covered this story extensively in this, I mean, in every alert, but this latest issue of the alert service, I really want to um, promote for people because it's, it's an excellent one. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. The headline on the front page is, How Drunk Were Those Who Took the Pub Test? <laughs> um, but there's also a feature in there we'll discuss as well, just, just briefly, called bring on the postal banking revolution, right? So um, this is the other, the, this question of the pub test is the other issue that the conviction of uh, Christine Holgate hung on. Because in order to, for this report to make a finding against her, the government said to them, to the Maddox lawyers, find, like ascertain whether what she did was met public expectations. And in Australia, we call that the pub test. And in fact, John Howard invented this term, oh, it doesn't pass the pub test. And it's such a bogus thing, right? Why do politicians like talking about the pub test? Because it's, it's not verifiable. Who knows what the, what the pub test ever is, what public expectations are. If you feed the people in the pub and they're drunk enough a whole lot of crap, they're going to they're gonna accept what you're saying. If you feed them the truth, they're, they're going to have a different opinion, right? And so... They were able to create this sense of, a, sense of a lynch mob in the Australian public by the tabloid media and the politicians like Kimberly Kitching who initiated this attack from the Labor Party. Remember, this is a joint attack by both parties. The Labor Party's Kimberly Kitching initiated this attack with, with, in a totally dishonest way and they made out um, Christine Holgate to be some kind of Marie Antoinette splurging taxpayers' money in a pandemic recession and none of that was true, right? Mm. But the people in the pub, if, that was, if that's what they were told, they would have been outraged. And well, it, it wasn't true. Oh, well, Barnaby Joyce said, he stood up in Parliament, as you saw from the ad, and said exactly. that he was wrong. The exactly. government's wrong. So this, the idea of claiming a pub test is, what, is, is the reason that something, um, you know, that, 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 that uh, the chief executive of a successful government business enterprise should be forced out and the, and the, uh, the business model she set up should be completely undermined by this political attack because it doesn't, didn't pass the pub test proves what, what you're talking about in Australia is a lot of corruption, right? And we identified from the beginning, Craig, and we're going to talk about this more in the next segment, there is no more corruption in Australia than in the relationship between the banks and, and the two major parties. That is where the most corruption lies, and I'm going to state that emphatically. The relationship between the big banks and the major parties is as corrupt as anything in the world. And we'll, and we'll prove it in the next segment, but most people would, would recognise that to be true. And as we said from the beginning, if the banks had any sense that Christine Holgate was interested in Australia Post becoming a bank, and, and, this, and the reason that, that Ad quotes that, because that came up in 2018, in the middle of the Royal Commission, 
right? It made perfect sense for what, here are these corrupt banks being exposed for how bad they are. What is the alternative to the big four? That's how it came up. And that article said the banks will fight it tooth and nail. Mm. We had the sense that this is the sort of agenda that she got in the way of, right? And as, as, as well as the privatisation agenda. So it turns out our policy of an Australia Post Bank is actually a winner. One, not, one, because it's a great idea. It would provide a service to the Australian people. And we'll put up a map. Uh, have a look at this map from, from this article in the alert service. And we've taken this from the per capita report on Australia Post Bank proposal, but they took it from the Reserve Bank. Those red dots are every Australia Post branch, post office in Australia that's more than 50 kilometres from your local, from the nearest bank. And look at the distribution across the country. This is the strength of Australia Post. It's first and foremost a service to the public. If you marry that with banking, right, it, they will be providing banking services all around the country in banks in ways that banks are just not interested in, right? So one, there's, that, that's a winner. Two, those services will make a big difference to those local communities they're serving. And three, this is happening all around the world. And that's what we go through in this article, Bring on the Postal Banking Revolution, because you've got... I mean, we just, I won't go through all the details now, but we talk about Italy, Ireland, Bulgaria, um, Brazil, China, New Zealand, Canada. And just on the Canada one, the little bit we show in, on the Canada one, you can see in, in Canada, like Australia, the banks, the private banks just hate this idea and doing everything they can to try and crush it. But there's a big push for a postal bank in Canada. Um, and then, of course, where, where there are some postal banks, there's a big push to privatise them, like in Japan, like in the UK, um, like in, uh, in India, not in India, like in Switzerland, etc. right? Um, but the, why, why, why privatise it? Because the, the big banks are pretty influential on politics in those countries as well, right? But have a look at that because what it, what it does show is just how widespread postal banking is around the world because it does provide a perfect solution to the problem of s sustaining postal services at a time when, of the internet where fewer people are sending mail, but by providing, combining it with financial services, it subsidises it and makes it profitable, plus it fills the hole that the private banking system don't be, uh, want to provide anymore through those, in the form of those services. And it right. also pro provides, Robbie, the, the opportunity for an actual national bank in this country that can then feed, feed the, uh, the uh, Australia Post banks in terms of being able to support them. But the point I want to make here is that, look, there's been a huge fight over, over the last century or so with the private banking system in this country. And you've got to go back and look at the Second World War. Look at what Curtin and Chifley actually did to rein in the control of the private banks to prosecute the war. Chifley himself was on the 1930s Royal Commission at a bank. He came yep. out with a dissenting report and basically said, look, the private banking system has no interest in the general welfare or the public good yep. because whenever it comes to, when push comes to shove, the private banks are always going to look after themselves. And that's why we need the Commonwealth Bank at that point to act as a public bank. For the, for the general welfare. And then you have a look what he tried to do after the war. He said, look, we've got to continue the regulations uh, against the, the, the private banks to make sure they do do the right thing, lend to industry, lend to, to uh, farmers and so forth. And he went as far as to try and nationalise them to say, look, the issuance of credit into an economy is not the purview of the private banking system. It should be the role of government. Now, he was defeated. We ended up with Menzies coming back in. And since that point, the private banks have had free reign on the economy, on the issuance of credit, and, in, 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 as you and for referred a to... For a couple of decades there, Craig, they were sort of reflecting of the... There was a lot more common sense involved and a more general regulation of the economy. Once that was all taken away in, in the 80s, they went bonkers. In 73, the deregulation of New Bretton Woods was, was dismantled and, you know, you had the whole deregulation, privatisation issue come up. And we've done an enormous amount of work since 1996 on this issue as an organisation, Robbie. So we've got this thing in spades. And the point is that you can't trust the banks. And you could bring back that whole infrastructure with an Australia, starting with an Australia Post Bank. National, we, we think it should be attached to a National Development Bank so that whatever the Post Office Bank doesn't lend out, it can on lend to the National Development Bank for investment in infrastructure. And the savings of, a, of people can be both secure and put to work for the good of Australia. That's right. right. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to go even harder against these banks. <laughs> Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Finally, keep financial predators on the leash. 
Now, Craig, we're going to talk about responsible lending laws that the, the Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg want to repeal in Australia. But before we do, let's talk about GameStop. Because <laughs> this is an example, we don't want to go through all the details, but this is an example of why um, there's a certain type of regulation that is absolutely necessary for a financial system to work, right? So if you don't know the story, um, GameStop is just this thing that's erupted this month. It's an American stock from a pretty run-of-the-mill retail store that sells video games or buys and swaps video games. And it's bit, short sellers have been shorting the stock. And so the official, the, the, the story that's erupted this week, which is sort of a mind-blowing, is that this kind of like Mad Max post-apocalyptic army of, of um, uh, a rabble army of ragtag retail investors on the Reddit social media site, of which there's many, many, many of them decided to take on the short sellers. So Craig, just, just explain short selling quickly. Yeah, Rob, it's it basically a... gambling. It's speculation. The point is, you've got a, a, a speculator goes to the broker and says, can, you, can I borrow some stock in this company? Borrow, not buy, but yeah. borrow. So they set up a contract that say, in seven days they'll pay that, they'll give that stock back after they've borrowed it. They borrow the stock and they sell it at the current market price. And if that was say $2, right, then they sell it 1,000 shares at $2, they get 2,000 bucks. In six days' time, they hope the price of the shares has gone down. They're short of that stock at the moment. They don't actually have any because they've sold it. So they, if the price of the stock goes down to, say, $1.50, they buy that stock back with the $2,000 that they've got in their bank yep. account and they make a $500 profit. And that's how shorting works. And they, then they, they, they reclaim their position with the broker and they've just made a lot of and money. And it works really well if they're right that the market's going to fall. But if it goes up, what you have is say if that after six days the, 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 the price of the shares goes to $2.20, $2.30, right, they have to find that extra money yep. out of their pocket. They don't make a profit, they make a loss. So and what's happened is these really big Wall Street hedge funds were short in this stock and there's, the story is it's David versus Goliath, this ragtag army of lots and lots of retail investors coordinating through this Reddit sub um, chat room. Um, flooded the stock, drove it up hundreds and hundreds, over a thousand percent in a few weeks, etc. And a massive losses have been made by hedge funds. And the hedge funds are now sucking their thumb and saying, we need regulation to protect us from this. And to <laughs> me, that's hilarious because years ago, they were the predators in 2008. The short sellers were the predators. This is a right? free market, Robbie. And now they've become the prey. That's right. Um, now that said, I will mention there's, there's also a possibility that this whole David and Goliath story is actually a scam where other players called dark pools have sucked in these retail investors so that, that when they drive the stock up big, they can, they can bail out at the top and really pocket the savings and these retail guys let, get left hold, carrying the can. Yeah. But we'll, have to, we'll see what emerges about that. There's a point we want to make though, Craig, about this particular problem. I think the insanity of speculation, Robbie, has just been illustrated. This is pure gambling. Yeah. And you cannot have an economy or a banking system that's run on a pure gambling, gambling model. That's why we've always talked about the need for Glass-Steagall, where you separate out and you can uh, protect the commercial banking system that's necessary for the economy from all this other stuff. We're not saying we're going to ban, uh, ban all this other stuff, but don't allow well, it to if be... Well, if you try and ban it, it's very difficult. The, the, in the nature of the financial system, people always come up with ways around that. So instead yeah. of trying to regulate everything, you've got to have... Glass-Steagall is a firewall or an unbridgeable gulf, right? Where you say, okay, if you're on that side in the Mad Max Badlands, you're on your own. You'll yep. never be bailed out. Only gamble with your own money you can afford to lose, and that's it. But on this side, we're keeping everything safe. And most of those people on the other side, Robbie, in the merchant banking side, they understand that. Yes. They're happy with that. But the problem is that the government has allowed the access to taxpayers' money and to now deposits through bail-in. All right, just, Craig, hold that thought. It's goodbye to Channel 31 viewers. We'll stay on YouTube, though. Yeah, so if the government's allowed all the regulations to be watered down, deregulation, to the point that the, the general economy, people's savings, their yeah. bank accounts are all being exposed to this stuff and it's all been allowed to happen. With Glass-Steagall, that can't happen. No, exactly. Now, um, sorry for the Channel 31's to miss, this viewers miss this part of the conversation because what we want to talk about is actually responsible lending laws because it's, it's the same mentality, right? So what's happened is this. There's a bill in Parliament and we're going to ask people to go to our website, look at the details and by next Wednesday make a submission on this bill, right? Please do, um, because this is one of those things where remember what 2018 was like in terms of the public revelations about the banks. Remember how shocking it was. And remember all the 
um, oh so sincere platitudes from politicians about how shocking that was and that should never have been allowed to happen. Tut, 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 right? Well, it was all bunk what the politicians did. These, are, these people are, um, you know, as, as the Lord Jesus Christ said of the Pharisees, their mouths are an open sepulchre. <laughs> the crap that comes out of the, 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 the stink that comes out of them. Because two years later, Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg have jumped at the opportunity to do something that Commissioner Hayne, at the end of that Royal Commission, in that report that he handed to Josh Frydenberg, remember, and Josh Frydenberg, he wouldn't shake Josh Frydenberg's hand, right? Because he knew what a stunt this was, obviously. Um, not Two years later, they've come up with a way to water down responsible lending laws, right? And... Anna Blythe, Craig, the head of the Banking Association, she said, oh, banks have no interest. This, we need to get rid of these laws because they're not necessarily the too bureaucratic. There's too much of them. And anyway, banks have no interest in lending to money to people who cannot afford to repay. And that is a pile of garbage. They have ways and means like you wouldn't believe to extract money from people, right? So the two we want to highlight... And I'll, you know, a few months ago, I did an interview with the great, great warrior against this kind of bad banking, Denise Braley, from the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association. And that interview was about Scott Morrison's responsible lending laws will, will be, um, uh, will, will throw lambs to slaughter, right? So um, Denise, more than anyone, has documented how banks in the last 20 years aggressively threw money at people, especially the elderly, who were asset rich and income poor, right? But their asset was a hell of an asset because they would have paid it off in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s before the property prices boomed. And then the banks just saw the value in those property prices, right? And they, they, they cooked the books, they, 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 they dodged up the lending documentation. They committed actual fraud to suck these people into mortgages that when they couldn't afford to repay, the bank could just go and grab the asset, right? These banks are predatory asset strippers. And that's how they make money. Of course, they have an interest in, in lending money to people who cannot afford to pay. The other way they can do it, Craig, they can make money from bad loans is through derivatives, right? And there's umpteen ways to do this. And you know, if you're old enough, you remember from 2008, collateralized debt obligations, collateralized loan obligations, um, mortgage-backed securities, right? Where you're taking debt and you're bundling up and you're passing it off to somebody else. And the ultimate buyer is some unsuspecting schmuck on the other side of the world who has no clue that the, that the, that the security he's just bought is based on um, loans, like the American ones. They were loans to unemployed people in slums, right, who, who, who the banks had, had lent money to that had no hope of paying it back, and Australian councils were holding those securities, right? And, of course, the banks made a killing out of all that. Um, and then with other types of derivatives like interest rate derivatives, they can just come up with all kinds of complicated gambles on those bad loans, right, um, on, on, the, on different interest rate things, etc., and make money that way. And they leverage it and make big amounts of money. Mm. The banks cannot be trusted in this area. So it is an outrage. It just shows you how corrupt our system is in Australia, Craig, that um, not, not even two years after that Royal Commission report was handed down, Frydenberg, a former Deutsche Bank banker, and Scott Morrison, that I've never seen anyone in, in Australian politics as slavishly devoted to the banks as Scott Morrison. They have seized on a way to already undermine the, the, um, the, the report from the Royal Commission. And this is the same Scott Morrison that has attacked Christine Holgate, exactly. who wants to bring back, or make Australia Post profitable and also look at Australia Post bank. So it's all lawful, Robbie. And, yep. you know, as as we've said before, the issue, the issue here actually comes back to a bigger issue, which is national banking, the need for Australia to have a bank that can actually fund the infrastructure and the development of the nation. And, of course, the Liberal Party will not have a bar of that. So this is a major fight. Yeah. And you, you can see the colours everywhere of the So corruption. we'll put a link below on the YouTube page where you can go to the press release, read the details that I've just ranted about. <laughs> um, <laughs> Click on the link, please, mm -hmm. by next Wednesday. Just fire off and find the, the place to send the email to and fire off an email expressing your outrage as, as an Australian citizen. They would even contemplate doing this, right, what, for whatever excuse they have. Actually, their excuse at the time when they first put up this bill was, oh, oh we need to, the economy needs to be revived, so we need to get um, the shackles off the banks to lend. 
Well, they're lending like crazy now anyway for the property market, as usual. That's what they love lending for. If you really want credit going to the real economy, set up a national bank, as you said. Right. Robert, okay. I think, I think the issue here is that the, the, our, the people are watching this YouTube video or the Channel 31. If they're not doing anything towards campaigning for us, for these sort of issues or with us, with these sort of issues, then please don't complain. Yeah. Get <laughs> active. Get on the internet. Go to our website. There's plenty of marching orders there, what we call marching orders, for people to actually do something about it. If you're not doing something about it, don't complain. Yeah. And I think that this is really where, as we've proven in the past, through the cash ban mobilisation and through other mobilisations, then when ordinary people, when I say ordinary, I mean they're not actually ordinary people, aren't they? Everyday ordinary. people. Everyday people uh, act. The politicians really do sit up and listen. Sure. And that's the key here. Well, it's one of the I'm sure it's one of the reasons, going back to the first story, that the Holgate report was released. They, were going, they actually yeah. intended to put, keep that secret for two decades. But under pressure, they released it. They just tried, maybe tried to dodge it up before they did. They're responding to the, the campaigns we go on, right? So we just have to be consistent on that. And, and, and the banks and the government, the, the bank's control over parliament is so great that you're not going to get change to the banking system that's so desperately needed from inside the two major parties. It's got to come from the people. And we've got to be relentless in demanding it, right? Because that's how you're going to change the political trajectory of Australia. And, and we're doing it. That's through this key. kind of Yeah, and through this kind of action, right? So take the time the next between now and next Wednesday when you um, watch this show to make that submission, please. All right, Craig, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks for your contribution. Thanks to the viewer for tuning in and tune in next week for more. Mm -hmm.